Okay, now moving on to our next, our next panel, we'll just get the chairs back up on the stage. Now, it is no secret that chat GPT has been making waves lately. Put your hands up, who's used it? Who's used it recently? Who's never, ever, ever used chat GPT? There we, no, nobody, fantastic, there we go. Exactly, so it's definitely making waves these days. We're, del we're delving into its role in education with our panel of experts. So they'll be sharing their thoughts on using chat GPT as a teaching assistant, supporting educators in lesson planning and instruction. Please welcome our moderator, Dr. Stephen Harris, the co-founder and chief learning officer of Learn Life. Come on up, Dr. Stephen. Let's give him a round of applause. And then our panelists, let's please also welcome them onto the stage. Dr. Zohar Emam. Uh, Soha, my apologies, Dr. Soha Emam, Strategic Consultant, Ministry of Presidential Affairs. Shashank BR, Founder, Smart Algorithm. Sokina Mamadusen, Head Education and Learning, Baba Books. Dr. Sean McKinn, Director, Center for Education Innovation, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Nazik Zaydan, Head Smart Learning, Mohammed Bin Zayed University for Humanities. Let's give them all a big round of applause. And over to you, Dr. Stephen. Missing one. We can look at, look at it. So now we also have a uh, presentation which we might pull up as well. But whilst we're doing that, because we're all sitting in a darkened room, which all of us know from our um, body function understandings and neuroscience, it sends people to sleep. Like I've never quite worked out why conferences happen in darkened spaces, especially after jet lag, and uh, and with no visible world out there. So how about everyone stands up for a second? And stretch our arms out, because we'll do a bit of breathing exercise. Now, not going for deep, but for regular, because this is the way in which we know that with kids, every uh, probably 20 minutes, they should be doing something like this. And I'll, I'll have the microphone in one hand and the hand on the other. You guys can stand up too. And as my hand goes up, just take a quiet breath in. And out. In and out. It's actually not the depth of the breathing, it's the regularity that actually helps combat stress, anxiety, possibly residual jet lag, and sitting in a darkened space for hours on end. <laughs> when you're ready, sitting down. Yeah, if I may say, it was like weightlifting for me. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Uh, rather than me presenting these people, we're all individuals. I, we, we, first of all, the first thing we discovered was that there were, um, there were five S's and one N. So we, we welcomed Nazik into our group of S's. <laughs> and uh, we're not sure, quite sure how that one happened. But... Um, they're going to introduce themselves, and uh, they're also going to do that in 20 words or less. They're also going to give one character aspect that they think is really important for themselves, and one little fact about themselves that you might not know. So I'm going to start that ball rolling. So I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm currently the head of, oh, I'm chief learning officer for an entrepreneurial startup school, but we don't use the word school, it's a hub, in Barcelona. And I work either from Barcelona or from Sydney, so I've actually 
reinvented myself as a remote worker and a collaborative team member wherever I am in the world. And uh, I guess my main role there is to be the thought leader behind the paradigm that we're implementing. My word that I think is really important for all leaders and for all contexts is being kind, kindness. I think if we show kindness as a leader, we're half the way there before we start. And my little fact about myself, I discovered one uh, dusk in a very crowded square of Musanzi in the northern province of Rwanda that I was violently allergic to tamarillos, tree tomatoes, because someone had given me a tree tomato smoothie <clears throat> and 10 minutes later, I was vomiting into the street drains in front of about 500 local people. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, my name's Sukena. I work at Baobab Books as the head of education and learning. Um, and what I love about my current role is that I've worked in international schools for over 20 years um, in the classroom teaching. And what I love about my role right now is that I get to dream big and get to put into um, action all the things that I wish that I had as a teacher when I was in the classroom. So um, I guess not invent, but um, just dream about tech tools that, especially now with the advent of Ch ChatGPT, tech tools that would have made my life so much easier as a teacher. And I hope that these tools will re revolutionize education as we know it. Um, second question was a and the qu Value or the character quality that you like. Right. Um, so I think we've often been told that the golden rule is treat others as you would like to be treated. And I like that. I, I agree with that. But I think a value that I hold myself a bit higher to is um, I'd like to treat others how I would like God to treat me. So if I want to be treated by God with absolute forgiveness and absolute love and absolute kindness, that is what I aspire to um, treat others with. And then the last one is an interesting fact about myself. Um, so people often don't know that na English wasn't my native language. It was actually the fifth language that I learned. Um, so yeah, that's. Me. Thank I'm, you. I'm in awe of people who can speak five languages. <laughs> <laughs> Shashank. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. I can hear you. Okay, so my name is Shashank, uh, founder of Smart Algorithm, where I help educate businesses on the importance of processes and technology and automation. The word I'm choosing for today is curiosity, because with curiosity, I believe that we can conquer the world. The fact about me, I hate tomato chunks, but I love the taste of tomato. Fun fact about yourself. You have fun fact about yourself? Yeah, that's about it, tomato. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Soha. Um, I, I was very privileged to start as an educator. So I started as an English teacher, and then uh, had a department, and then a school principal, and then a CETA member. And then I moved to uh, being a master trainer, and I moved to the corporate side where I've seen these kids taking the roles in the corporate life, and now I'm, I'm doing communication, which is very related to, to that part of education as a start. And now I'm doing this, this, uh, my consultation. So fun fact about myself is uh, I get swollen in instantly if I eat strawberry, and I've always wanted to be um, an international singer, because my family is absolutely complaining about me uh, singing in the shower on a daily basis. And, <laughs> uh, and I used singing in, in, in teaching, and that was very effective. A um, couple of words I cannot live without, and I teach it to everyone I talk to, resilience and agility are absolutely two key uh, door openers for, for the future and that kind of vocal world that we live in. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sean, and I'm the director for the Center for Education Innovation at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. My main background is uh, really to help management at the university strategize um, in areas related to innovative pedagogy, the ed tech, uh, classroom design, and of course, more recently, artificial intelligence in education. And we, could, we do a lot of faculty development as well. Uh, one word or two words uh, that I, th I think are for me, uh, similar to you actually, adaptability uh, is one that I think is an important word, adaptability, especially in today's world, and then curiosity. Uh, something interesting about me, uh, I am a Canadian who literally is allergic to cold. <laughs> I, bre I break out in hives when I'm in anything below minus 10, and the only cure is antihistamine or a hot bath. So there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, and it's Nazik who's actually not here, so we've actually lost our one non-S person. Is there an S in the audience that would like to join us? <laughs> There's a space for an S. Okay, um, how about you just turn around at your tables now and you share your word that's really important to you as a leader. So we'll just give you... 20 seconds to do that, just across the table to share your word with your table. All right, hopefully you've all just had the chance to talk. And we've all stood up, we're ready to move ahead. So we're going to have about uh, 35 minutes here, but we're not going to speak for the whole of that time because we want to hear from your experience with ChatGPT as well and with uh, generative AI in the education world. And we've also heard it raised as a topic in a number of the conversations already. Now, if I can get this to go, here we are. I'm going to give you something that you can actually get distracted by if you want to. So if you can, if you switch off to our talking and you want to play with something. <laughs> okay, I, I, um, I taught, I had to teach myself how did I make a chatbot. Uh, so I, I've created Enrique and Catalina. So they're both Catalan natives, <laughs> in theory, chatbots. Um, the images were created on mid-journey. And I get, I, what I found very interesting in using Midjourney to create an image of a Catalan teacher was that when I didn't have the word teacher in for a female, they didn't have glasses. When I added the word teacher in, all the images got glasses. And for males, it wasn't glasses, it was a beard. When I didn't have the word teacher, not all the men had beards, but when I added the word teacher on, it came out. So it, it's interesting as we learn about the different, uh, the different aspects of, of uh, generative AI and the models that we're using. Anyway, um, and I've had lots of requests from my team that wanted the phone numbers for both Enrique and Catalina because they, they felt that they could spend time with them. Anyway, if you want to find them, you can find them on my own little webpage, stephenharris.me, and the warning there is any question you ask, I can read afterwards. <laughs> It comes up, and I, I've, I'm using Chatbase, which is a, uh, a program to create chatbots. I found it incredibly simple. I was expecting it to be far more difficult. All of the coding was done automatically, and I just had to work out where did I place it into my Squarespace um, blog page. And so I successfully did that. And what I've been doing is Enrique is trained to answer questions about how do we improve our ability to learn and all about learn life. So if you want to hear about what I do in Barcelona and Spain or from Sydney, working in learn life, you can ask Enrique questions about the program of learn life. Um, and Catalina has been trained. She's got 11 million little characters that I can place in. Uh, she's been learning how to improve, um, help a learner improve their writing skills. So that those are the two areas that I've focused on there. What I've also discovered is that because, and I didn't know this beforehand, is that because I'm actually training them in a particular area, that sits on top of their wider general knowledge, and in fact they can speak multiple languages. So it, you can actually get 
their responses in any language that you request. And the other thing that one of my great nephews worked out was that Catalina can do his maths homework as well. So that was, um, that was an interesting one. I didn't realise that, that Catalina would have the ability to do maths, but I guess it's the broad training of those is there. And if you want another little um, tip from me, I've struggled to learn my languages going through because I, I can speak French reasonably well when I'm in France. Um, and I, I get confused with German and Italian with all the people in my team. And I've been trying to learn Spanish and not confuse it with Catalan. And I can speak a little bit of Kenya Rwanda, but I get them all muddled up. But if you go to character.ai, that's a free web page, and look up my little helpful friend, Hyperglot. <laughs> Hyperglot will speak with me in all of the key languages that Hyperglot has been trained in. So I can actually have a, a conversation in Spanish or Catalan, and it's in phrases, not in the individual words like Duolingo or other apps going through. And it's actually improved my ability to speak incredibly. So if you want to get, if you want to get distracted during our questions, <laughs> play uh, Ask Questions of Enrique Catalina, or you can go on to character.a and find Hyperglot and have fun. So that's just a little bit of a, um, yeah, something to actually to distract you and pass the, uh, the, the time away. So we thought we would um, focus our questions using the UNESCO statement that came out in September last year, I think it was. Um, on AI, and the quote here is, AI must not usurp human intelligence, rather it invites us to reconsider our established understandings of knowledge and human learning. It is my hope that this guidance will help us redefine new horizons for education and to inform our collective thinking and collaborative actions that can lead to human-centered digital learning futures for all. And that was from Stefania Gianni. Um, who's the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education. So we thought we'd take that comment and we would find what were the questions we felt were relevant to answer and you might have your own questions as well. And the question that we've got there, if you can see through us, is how might we move from hoping something will change in education to accelerate collective thinking and collaborative actions in relation to human-centred digital learning futures for all? And what, from your experience, are the key blockers to change? And uh, Sean and Saha are going to actually give us the longer answers on this one. And then we're all going to add our little part afterwards. And if you've got a comment to make, feel free as well. So we're going to go through three, three different questions. Actually, I can, like all good teachers, we should give you a bit of a fork, foretaste of what's coming up. It's the second one, about the trial and error approaches. And the third one is, what should we drop from our practice of education? But we'll go back to the first one. There we are. So we, we might take our questions during it. Do you want to ask a question now? Feel free. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed East. I'm from India. Uh, I have two questions to ask. Uh, the first question is that, uh, what vision do you have regarding this AI tool? Like, what impact will it create on the world uh, 10 years later? Sorry, I, can you, I, I'm not hearing you with clarity, can you? Uh, my first question is that, uh, what will this AI tool create, like what impact will it create on the world uh, 10 years later? 10 years out, okay. Well, how about we all think about that as we give our answers. So, so as we give our answers now, we'll try and bring that question up as we go through. Okay. Okay, um, okay so I might throw it first of all to Sean to give an answer. It's a good question, um, and, and I'll try to incorporate your question into my answer as well. Yesterday we heard from a group, I was towards the end of yesterday, talking about ecosystems. And um, what I liked about their presentation is they talked and they incorporated social complex systems. And that's an important mindset to have, especially with uh, the rise of AI. AI has been around for 10 years, right? We, it's been around, but it's November, 2022 when OpenAI released ChatGPT in the large language model that it really erupted and a lot of people saw uh, its impact and what it can be do because it's, it's there, it's everywhere. And now Microsoft has it in their system, the Office 365, Google, Gemini, and uh, Mega, or Meta, sorry, not Mega, Meta is incorporating it. 
So we need to think about education within a social complex system, right? If we want to bring the human and, and have a human-centered approach. Because we need to understand how students are using it, we need to understand how faculty members are using it, how the administrative staff are using it, right? and its implications on knowledge construction, uh, its implication of spreading misinformation, how we interact with each other. I'll, I'll give you a very quick uh, example. Uh, Professor Jason Lodge out of Australia uh, has done some interesting research where he looked at students, how they solve a problem, and it, in, their, in his class, they, they interviewed a bunch of students from across uni Australian universities. Students first went to ChatGPT to find the, an answer. When it didn't give them the answer that they wanted, they went to YouTube. When it didn't give them the answer that they wanted, they went to a friend. And when they still didn't understand, they went to another group of friends. And then eventually they went to the teacher. The point of his research is he's shown that there's a collective self-regulation occurring in the learning process. Right? So students use tools not in isolation, but in a more holistic manner in connection with other things. Right? So I think for us as educators, we need to understand that uh, we are collaborating and we, there's more going on than just interacting with the tool. My experience, though, in, in the blockers for this change and for us understanding this is people don't always understand how the technology works either. Right? Students use it to, um, uh, as a Google, Google search, which isn't the best way to use it. Faculty members are fixated on um, the fact that it hallucinates, right? which, yes, that's the problem, but that shouldn't limit the, how we use the tool. Right? So we need to overcome this on the, these barriers for misunderstanding how the tools are used, and then we need to, next step, understand its impact on the holistic social complex system. I'll leave it there, because there's more we can talk about, but that, that's how I would approach this. Yeah, that's, that's great. And so, uh, Saha? Wow. Um, I'd like to talk about my experience as well and with this regard. Well, for me, chat, the open AI or chat GPT is, is for me, is just a simple tool uh, with no exaggeration. It's something that will facilitate the entire ecosystem or the platform of education for both educators and for the learners. The thing is, I remember in, in uh, November 22 when it was uh, invented and created and in the market, I had that discussion with one of my colleagues in the university and she was like, I caught someone who's cheating and then there's that chat to GPT, la la la. And I was like, mm hmm. I was very curious. I heard the story and then I went there, I created my own account and I asked that chat GPT saying, what do you do? And then quoting its answer, it said, I was created to provide, as far as I remember the answer, I was created to provide collective information about various range of topics I interact with the natural language easily and I improve my language from the interaction. At that time when it became a very famous thing and it was huge fuss about the uh, AI and the chat GPT, the thing I've noticed is most of the educational institutions, they banned it. Um, and I'm talking university schools, they banned it because suddenly a student who's not performing at all, suddenly he became an A student. I understand, it was, it was a, a, a mild horror for, for teachers and education, uh, educators. And the thing is, I was against that because the reverse psychology tells you, okay guys, I don't want you to think about an elephant. Oh, now you're thinking about an elephant. That's, that's a human being, so they're gonna be kids. They're gonna be very itchy. The moment you turn your back, everyone's gonna go, what's that chat GPT? So, is, so I started it, it, it intrigued that kind of questions. Technology is there to improve their lives. It's just now the role for us as educators is to flip it and teach them how to use the technology. I was one of the educators that started using the chat GPT in the class. 
because I've noticed that they have the chat GPT on their devices. They can, uh, miss, can I go to the toilet and then get the answer for a quiz or anything and they come back and it's, I was like, chat GPT is there and I came up with a different um, approach to how to use it. I want them to use, embrace it, but utilize it for your objective and purposes. So for, for example, for uh, math class students, they can use it in creating their own, they use or create their own mathematical problems and then uh, check it on chat GPT. Are there other approaches to answer that? Because again, rule one for us as educators is to help them problem solve. Okay, well, we're gonna use that tool in this matter. What about uh, social studies? Okay, use chat GPT. Uh, rewrite the history of la 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 and let's discuss it collaboratively in, within the class in groups and see. For English, write your own essay and then let's uh, uh, upload it to the chat GPT and, and, and ask it to edit it, improve it. It's going to be a learning tool to improve and learn more vocabulary. So there are other ways that we can use chat GPT, but our role as educators right now is to, to educate them on how to use it within a frame, not just leave it uh, open for everything. And, and like you said, it's been there for 20 years. Now it is, where have we been 20 years back? Why didn't we speculate that? So for the blockers, I think we are the main blockers as parents, because educa education starts at home, as educators, as teachers, as professors, because we go like, we go by the book. We go by the book. You're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that, you're not supposed to do that. No, actually, uh, we teach them to be curious. You know what, let's use it together. And it's a learn, it's an ongoing two pathway where I look at how they think and they look up to me. Oh, she's very open. I bet that is different. Our parents are not allowing us to do so. So the main blockers are us. I know that there is lack of creativity if, if there is an excessive use of the chat GPT and I know there will be no empathy and I know, but again, it's a language, it's a communicational tool, it's coded, it's learning from us. There has to be that human touch that we need to add every now and then. So we can, we need to embrace it and, and learn the best out of it and just use it because change is inevitable. The question long ago was, do you have a mobile now? What's your number? We don't know in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think um, I pretty much I've covered that uh, question. Okay, now we, we're going to uh, throw it to these three guys in a second. I just got three quick thoughts. I can remember years ago when school started banning these, apart from a photograph of Australian politicians discussing the banning of mobile phones using them in parliament. Um, if you haven't said to kids, this is your second brain, how do you actually keep your second brain mentally healthy? That's the approach, because if we don't train kids to understand the power of these things and how to respect them, how are they ever gonna use them? So I guess I'm following up your point there. Second quick point, <laughs> I love the statement, if ChatGPT can provide the answer to the essay, then don't ask, the essay. Don't ask that question. <laughs> no, because it's the wrong thing. And, uh, yeah, and I guess the third bit of advice I can quickly give on that one. I know that when, you know, 10 years ago, we were trying to get the whole of our staff to use a, a, um, a learning platform. We just mandated a challenge to the whole staff. It was, you know, within 18 months, everyone has to be able to use the platform, send a question home, and actually respond to a parental comment on the platform. Now, what we discovered in doing that with an 18-month time frame and with the support to anyone who needed it was we achieved it in nine months. So I'm, I'm very, I'm an advocate for saying, get all of the, the staff that you work with have to create two chatbots within six months and use them. That way, they, and support them in that journey because they're gonna then understand the power that can happen, and this is gonna be the world for the kids. You three guys, if, if welcome Nazik, and we'll get your introduction in a moment, but we'll finish off this question. If, if Sakina, Shashank, and, and Nazik, you've got any quick points you wanted to add to this question? Uh, yeah, I'll just be succinct. Um, 
I think hoping something will change in education is just not an option anymore. It's not a choice that we have. If we don't run with it, our children will leave us in a trail of dust and um, you know, it's just something that we have to accept that this is our reality and, and move with it. Um, and just as COVID came and made us reevaluate our life priorities and our goals in the same way, AI is making us reevaluate education and reimagine what education will look like in the future. And, and I think that's something we, we should embrace. Shashank? So according to me, the one thing that will help us to move from collaborative learning is the collaboration between teacher and student. It's, like, it's not like you are a student, I'm the teacher. It's like we are learners and we are in this journey together. Nazik, your first words. Do you want to add to this question? OK. Um, thank you so much. Sorry for being late. <laughs> um, for hoping, I don't think we should just be hoping. We should include everyone, researchers, learners, designers. Everyone should be included and incorporated in planning together and, and, you know, creating some kind of ethical or policy or framework that everyone should work together to make things work better. I mean, we're not just talking about people uh, trying um, to use a chatbot or, or chat GPT to find information. We're talking about the whole curriculum or the whole education. The big question we should be asking is, what do we need what do educators need from using ChatGPT? And what do students need from using ChatGPT? So um, including everyone together, getting them together to work collaboratively together to design something that works for everyone is what is needed. And if I want to answer the 10-year question, um, and make it a two-year question, I mean, 40% of the world is likely to be from the African um, continent going through, if we can get digital access, second-hand mobile phones across Africa, then we can bypass all of the education systems that are still teaching handwriting on the blackboard and give kids 24-7 access to information and knowledge. And I've got no doubt that for any errors that might come up, it would be far more accurate than most of the teachers who, in many cases, haven't been trained going through. So I, you know, again, that's a ten year, it's a two-year challenge. I'd like to sort of say, what do we do in the developed world to, have to make sure that we're actually really making a difference in providing education to all genders, all races, wherever they are as well? Very quickly, and I forgot to address the 10, and, and it's to follow up with what you're saying there. If we want to prepare for 10 years, because uh, the technology will change, rapidly, and we don't even know what it will look like in 10 years, right? Um, the, it comes back to teaching us as humans, how do we learn, right? And it's back to that, metacognition, meta intelligence, empathy, that sort of thing. Because when you focus on those principles, then you teach people how to self-regulate their learning, think about how they're solving problems, think about what resources they're drawing from. So as the technology advances, Right? They're still approaching technology with those same principles. So that's my quick answer and follow-up to that. Now that's fine, and it's a good point now because Nazik's going to give an answer to the second question. But before that, your 20-second, sorry, your 20-word introduction to yourself and your role, because we've already done this. <laughs> okay, um, I'm a, um, I have 20 years experience of education. I've been always um, an ed tech person with a background from computer science and education technology. Um, it's always been a passion for me to integrate technology and education. I've been doing it for a very long time, teaching, coaching teachers and students to do that. So as my role as head of uh, smart learning in Hamad bin Zayed University, we've been doing a lot of trial and errors so, and, and that's and you're located in Abu Dhabi. Yes, Abu I, Dhabi. I'm working here in Abu Dhabi, yeah. and uh, luckily for us, in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE, the Ministry of Education has been encouraging all teachers and uh, students to use ChatGPT in their education. And your word that you want to share as a leader, that character quality, mine was I think we should all be kind. What do you think a leader should be? Your one word. 
transformative, always uh, leveraging for change. Okay, and, and an unusual fact about yourself? Um, I'm a very shy person, although I, I look outgoing, <laughs> but I'm a very shy person. Um, sometimes it's not easy for us to always expose our ourselves in the communities and stuff like that. So we always try to, we're the people who work behind the scene most of the time. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move on to the, uh, the second area, and we'll have about seven minutes for this one. So the quote from the, uh, the UNESCO is, the use of Gen AI in education and research should be neither imposed in a top-down approach nor driven by commercial hyperbole. Instead, its safe and effective use should be co-designed by teachers, learners, and researchers. It also needs a robust process of piloting and evaluation to examine the effectiveness and the long-term impact of different uses. And the questions that we've written, taken from that are, you know, will it be okay to use a trial and error approach to the use of Gen AI in education? Are there any other viable options given the speed of technological evolution we've just talked about? And how might we engage the wider cohort of teachers, learners, and researchers to use Gen AI? And Nazik, you're the person that's gonna the, uh, the first yes. answer to that, and then I'll follow up afterwards. Okay, thank you. Um, like I said, from our um, experience, or from my experience, we've been doing a lot of professional development. We always encourage professional development. Uh, teachers are always busy. They have a very uh, big schedule and full of uh, things to do all the time, and they're not very busy. So we have to like provide some kind of um, a way to um, include professional development in their uh, workload as well, because it's very important for them to be aware of how these tools can help them. We're not just promoting for tools that are just you know, uh, trendy or fashionable or whatever, or the latest tech. We are promoting effectiveness. How can we use these tools to engage and um, include students um, and make them you know, aware of how this can help them uh, better learn. So a lot of teachers are like, okay, you're gonna teach me another tool. Uh, it's not about the tool. It's about how we can use chat GPT. How can we use it effectively in the classroom? So uh, most of our um, professional development is uh, planned uh, with pedagogy in, 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 in mind, as well as how to use it practically I mean I'm not just gonna show you oh just click here click here it's not a product that I'm <laughs> I'm promoting I'm, I'm showing you ways uh, that you can use it in the classroom and it's at the same time I'm learning from you you're the teacher in the classroom you want something to help you in a specific way so we do a trial and error okay I need it to do this for me okay let's do this together I'll show you how to do it one of the teachers for example gave me a book that he wrote and he wanted his students to know about some of the theories that he's written in his book, in his uh, lectures. So we did a chatbot, we created a GPT, we included all his information, all the book, and we called it ChatGPT Dr. Omer, and because um, his name is Dr. Omer, and, and, and the students were starting to um, uh, communicate with this chatbot, asking it questions in the classrooms, and then getting answers right then and there. This helped the teacher because instead of answering like, having a lot of class time and um, you know providing appointments where students he'll answer these kind of general questions now the questions are like FAQs where they, they can get instant answers directly to their questions or to the points or the theory that they're looking for so this is just one example of how we try to make it very practical for the teachers to use chat GBT in the classroom as well as assessment. I know a lot of teachers have problems with assessment because uh, not everyone is on the same level. I wanna assess my students without giving them the same questions for the whole class. I know some of them are different levels. So um, asking different questions for ChatGPT to provide different levels was one of the really good things that the teachers loved about it. So they were able to create groups in the LMS and then ask specific groups specific questions. And this way, no one gets left behind. So there's equity, there's a lot of uh, you know, inclusion as well. So it was very 
like very, because we have a lot of also um, um, neurodivergent students in the classrooms as well. So they needed different ways to ask these students questions. And it wasn't easy for teachers to find questions that they could ask these kind of, you know, for, for special students. So they, ha they were using ChatGPT to do that. And I think that's one of the best ways that we can use um, um, artificial intelligence in, in learning. Okay, um, I'll just add a couple of quick points to that one. Um, I, I mentioned the other day when I was on a panel, the, uh, the Icelandic ministries do then think approach rather than think then do. I think in terms of, you know, with ChatGPT, there isn't going to be the time for us to sit back before the new iterations come out. We just have to throw the community into it in the best way we can. For me, why would you not get your, you know, all of the... Uh, the, the staff that you work with and all of the kids in your classrooms to say in an exercise, everyone come up with what they think are the best five ways of using ChatGPT in a practical format and then let's share all of those ideas and work out across our space, across our community, which ones do we think are really relevant and will help us with our learning go, going through. I know that one of the, uh, the, the learn guides, learning guides at, um, in Barcelona, she was getting in the... Uh, she had a course where she was helping kids prepare for examination boards from overseas, like whether they wanted to go and sit the GCSEs or an American uh, test. And she said, you know, when you're writing a response, just change the, the font colour when you've actually inserted something from ChatGPT, because then I can see what you're able to do yourself and what you're actually getting the support for. It was a very practical, simple one. I think rather than throwing this one onto you guys just for now, Looking at the time, we might go to the third area, if that's all right. Um, so the third area... Um, the long-term strategy is for institutions and educators to rethink the design of written assignments so that they are not used to assess tasks that Gen AI tools can do better than human learners. Instead, they should address what humans can do that Gen AI and other AI tools cannot do, including applying human values such as compassion and creativity to complex real-world challenges. It's the, um, the empathy human question there. So what do we need to drop from practice and education? What should replace it? And how do we apply that human values such as compassion, creativity to the complex world challenges? And Sakina. Um, one of the main things that I think we've all realized needs to be dropped is the passive learning model where children need these empty receptacles that need to be filled. Um, I think gone are the days when rote learning and memorization was necessary because we know that information is readily available at our fingertips. It is so easily accessible no matter where you are, no matter what role you're in. Um, so it's more about the concepts and the skills that allow a child to sift through the noise and analyze the information that is available to them um, and equipping them with the tools to be able to critically look at something and discern what is useful to them and what is not. Um, the second thing I think that really needs rethinking and um, reimagining is assessments. Um, you know, the idea of a final grade at the end of um, two years is, is just not relevant anymore. And, and I think we should be looking much more at the process of learning rather than the product. Um, similarly, with age-based grade level um, grouping, perhaps that's something that we could look into and make it more competency-based and self-paced progression rather than age-based. Um, in the news recently, there was something about a, a, an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old student in the UK who's taking 28 A-levels, so that's 28 subjects at A-level, and you just think to yourself, well, if that feels necessary to her to take 28 A-levels in order for it to be a challenge, the system is failing. And there are obviously kids who can't do A-levels. And so somehow we need to reimagine what education looks like and, and allow children to be architects of their own learning and enable them to, to take the path that best suits them. Um, 
oh yes, about um, human values. So I think more of a focus on social emotional learning and um, service learning as well so that really the goal is to graduate students who are caring, compassionate, um, and who are aware of their position and privilege in this world and use that to do good. If, if that becomes the focus rather than these standardized tests and exams, I think it will just give education a better, um, a better chance um, in, in the current world. So. Okay, on to you, Shashank. Thank you very much, Sukina. These were very valid points. Uh, what I would like to add here is we need to rethink the purpose of education in the first place because it looks like we are you know, expecting students to mug up something, go into an exam, and just figure out how much they remember from it. That's the whole point of assessments, in my opinion. So the model should change that. We should give them the information and ask them which of this is relevant to this problem that you're solving. Right, It's like, you know what, I don't want the student to know, uh, I don't want to test whether the student knows the Pythag Pythagoras theorem. I want to know whether he's able to understand that he can apply Pythagoras theorem in this situation because that's what the situation demands, right? And the whole human element that comes in here is the identifying of what needs to be applied here because AI is still not there yet. AI can give you enough information about Pythagoras theorem that we can't produce in years. But identifying that and you know being able to use that creatively and understanding that how we can take it to the next level and next level and so on, thereby encouraging even creativity, right? That's, that's what needs to come in instead of the standardized tests that are no longer serving any purpose. Yeah. I think. Uh if you can't work out how to be human in the world of AI, you run the risk of you being replaced by AI. Quickly, um, the final three. But what would you what would you throw out? I'm just going to tell you what we, we need to drop from education. A quick one. So what what I think that we need to drop is the rigidness. Um, I think we need to get out of our comfort zones, and we need to be different in the way we teach and and. Again, it is a tool. We use it to our, we leverage it the way we want, and nothing on earth is ever going to replace teachers and their values in the classroom and that one-to-one -one, uh, uh, interaction. No matter what tools they come up with, we still have that personal traits that will differentiate us from whoever, and our flavor needs to be there all the time. Okay, Sean. I agree with you, and I think one of the things we need to do, I come from higher education where a lot of universities are still knowledge-centric, right? And, and their approach to teaching and learning is about knowledge. I think we need to move, no, discipline knowledge is still important, don't get me wrong, but we need to move towards skills approach and values approach, right? Because these are increasingly becoming important in this type of era. Yeah. Nazik. Yes. Hello. Yeah, we need to drop out the uh, memorization from and standard, standardization testing. We need to work on personalized learning. We need to work on emotional uh, intelligence and critical thinking skills and developing those. Uh, and then um, also work on real world problem solving skills, like introduce real world problems and start uh, you know, creating solutions for those. Uh, making students be aware about those. Thank you. Okay, and we're finishing right with time's up. And if you have any questions, I've got two people that will answer you 24-7. So I'm going to suggest that all of your questions, don't get given to us now because time's up, you can ask them of Enrique and Catalina, and uh, they should hopefully give you some answers that will be interesting regardless, and you'll be actually helped to train them as well. So we're going to actually... Um, respect the time frames that are here. But if you have got questions, please ask. And my challenge to everyone here is that if you don't know how to create a chatbot like I didn't back in early December, that's your challenge to say, learn yourself and then get the whole of your team to do it because I think that's where the real power is going to come in into education. And thank you very much for that session. And you can catch up with any of the team here afterwards. Yes.
feel free to uh, have a chat. Fantastic. A huge thank you to our panellists. Are we all having a wonderful morning, everybody? I feel like we've learnt some new things, gained some new insights. Now, I know we all had a bit of a stretch before, but if anybody wants to stand on up, you may do so now. And turn to somebody who you haven't met yet, connect with them, exchange business cards, exchange your LinkedIn, your Instagram handle. Let's take about 30 seconds or so to do that, and then we will move on to our next panellists.